I'm James Hamilton, Senior Vice President and Distinguished Engineer at Amazon. Today we'll cover the history of silicon innovation at AWS. I'll go way back to 2012 where some of the first ideas were, were laid out. I'll introduce to some of the key players and I'll cover some of the key steps that drove the innovations that led to us all being in the same room today. What we're going to talk about today over the course of the entire day is there's five semiconductor lines at AWS. The first, the one we all know, Graviton, general purpose processor that has leading price performance across all EC2 instance types. Second is Inferentia. It's machine learning inference. We announced that in 2018 at reInvent. Third one is its partner, Trainium. Machine learning training announced at reInvent 2020. One you might not have heard of is the, the Nitro Solid State Drive, or SSD. It's focused on I.O. intensive workloads such as database and analytics, lower cost, faster, and less tail latency. Nice, stable latency. Biggest problem with SSDs is they go through periods of, of remapping and effectively garbage collection and leads to unusual delays. So fast is good. Uh, reliably fast is, is what, what we're focused on. The final member of the team, the fifth, is Nitro System. I refer to it as the unsung hero of the, of, the, of the entire product line. And the reason is, it's not an EC2 instance, and it never will be. It's not even directly customer visible. And in fact, we, we went a couple years, we never even talked about it externally, but customers were using it. It's the highest volume semiconductor part we have at AWS with over 20 million installed now. Um, it's just, it's boggling to think this, this idea that's, that's really only 10 years old now has 20 million in, installs. Every server that gets delivered into AWS has at least one, and many have, have multiple Nitro systems in, in, installed in them. The original idea dates back to 2012, and that's a key part. We're gonna go back to 2012 and have a look. So imagine this, we're back at, at um, Amazon day one south. Over, the, over to my left, that's the building. That's where all of AWS was back in 2012, just that single building, not even that big a building. The cafeteria's behind me. I'm kind of, I'm walking down the stairs. Peter DeSantis is, is heading up. Peter DeSantis is the senior vice president responsible for AWS um, utility computing including EC2, and he also leads all of our semiconductor efforts. Back in 2012, Peter was the, the general manager of EC2. And he's coming up the steps and he says to me, hey Jim, I've got this great idea. He says, look, let's put a dongle, whatever a dongle is, in every computer. We'll put a dongle between every server in our network and, and, and the entire network outside of it. Everything that comes into or out of an EC2 server has to flow through this dongle. It'll give us airtight security for all of the instance types, but more important is especially bare metal. We hadn't offered bare metal instances up until, up until this time, mainly because we just weren't comfortable from a security perspective. And at AWS, if we're not comfortable with security, we're just not gonna do it. So this idea, Peter thinks, is gonna enable that and solve some other problems as well. So, Thinking about it, seems to make sense. It's effectively, if you think about it, it's a server in a server. It's another computer as part of every one of our servers that gets, gets out there. It's, it's, it needs to be a multi-core processor, it needs PCIe attached, and it needs to have an AWS net, networking port. It would nail the security goal, which seems good, that seems very good. It would offload all of the hypervisor overhead, which has two wonderful things. One is it, it allows us to sell all of the, the um, cores on the, on the server, but, he, but most important is it makes our servers effectively bigger because if, if you're running hypervisors on there, it's less resources available to customers. So it sounds interesting. It sounds like it has a lot of potential. And the more I think about it, I go, I've seen this before. I've seen, there's many parallels here. One of them is, you know, back in the 80s when I got out of university, I went to work at IBM on mainframes. And there's many parallels between some of the cool stuff that's done on mainframes and what would be possible with Nitro System. 
It's a completely different implementation, but many of the same use cases can be delivered. Let me give you an example or two. When a mainframe does I.O., it doesn't, it doesn't really do the I.O. What it does is it sends it, off to, to, um, it's, it sends it off to a channel processor. The channel processor is an I.O. server. It's all it does. So the, the, the mainframe uh, starts the I.O., goes to the channel processor, all the work's done in the channel processor. The reason you'd want to do that is because mainframe resources are just so expensive and so valuable that you, want, you don't want to tax the central processor with, with simple, boring tasks like input-output operations. So the first thing is, hmm, you in fact could do that with Nitro system, and in fact we have. Second thing that, that was going on in the mainframe world that I think is, is super interesting and, and is really valuable is what's called RAS. That's reliability, availability, and serviceability. The, it's, it's, it's effectively, it's a service processor in a mainframe, which is the customer workloads run on the mainframe itself, and the service processor really is just there to respond to, to, to corrections, send, um, send alerts out, that kind of thing. So what Peter was proposing really could support all of these use cases and a lot more, but it can also be more cost effective. If you want to be cost effective, the first question is, well, why do it in hardware? Why not, why not just do it in software? And you absolutely could, not a problem at all. You certainly could do it, but if you do do it in software, all these ideas that I'm talking about just keep getting bigger, and as they get bigger, they consume more cycles, and so as they consume more cycles, it's a tax, an overhead on, on every server in our network. So it means customers get less resources. You can deal with that. You can reserve cores for just the, the hypervisor. But if you do that, there's still disturbances, noisy neighbor problems to customers. Caches, translation look-aside buffers are all shared resources in a server. And so if we're running workloads in, in, in support of the customer and the customer's running workloads on the same box, effectively it's a no, noisy neighbor situation where each can interrupt the others. It makes for... Um, a less good experience for the customer, and it's a less reliable uh, situation for us as well. So having a firm hardware division, a separation of concerns between the two, means everything we do, customers don't get impacted by. It means we've got a rock-solid security boundary between them, and we've got a platform where we can just keep innovating. You know, it's been a decade now, and we're still innovating and changing and, and, and updating and improving. And so it's nice that it's, it's off on a, on a separate system, it's off a Nitro system away from the customer's uh, service themselves. To make Nitro a, a reality, I mean, the hardest part of it is, is it's how do you have a server in a server without escalating costs? That's the biggest problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's great, but how do you keep this from making AWS more expensive? If you're going to have a server in every server, it can do so much more. We can add so much value, but it can't make a server more expensive in a material way or it just won't work. And if you think about that, the only way we can deliver that, the only way we can, we can make that happen is to vertically integrate. It means that server that's being embedded in every one of our servers and sometimes embedded many times has to be absolutely as low cost as possible, which means we're going to design the hardware all the way down to we're going to design the semiconductors. We're going to get the part fabbed. The whole thing is done by AWS because that's the only way we can deliver this vision without driving costs up. This is kind of the lead in from, from, from that discussion with Peter. I was thinking, this has really got a ton of potential. So well, I went back to my office um, in, in day one south, and the first thing I did is I got on the phone and said, look, I'm going to call uh, manufacturers of devices that could possibly meet the goals here. So I called network processor companies because, of course, they have definitely have parts that can do this. I called Bigfoot Networks, which was a, a now defunct uh, network interface card uh, accelerator gaming company. I spoke with network, network interface controllers. I called network security companies. And what I was after is a multi-core processor, PCIe attached, 
a custom AWS networking card and it can't drive the costs of an EC2 server materially. It's, there were several that caught our interest, but Cavium was particularly interesting because they had a very nice multi-core ARM-based network processor, absolutely as capable as we needed, arguably a little bit more capable. The company was fairly nimble and willing to, to, to make the changes that we need to make. The challenge was it was 10x the cost. That was a challenge we, ex we expected. So the bad news is we need to have a part that's one-tenth the cost. The good news is we could probably do a million units if we can find a way together, Cavium and us, to actually make this, make this part a reality. We gave it some thought, um, we, and Cavium said they think they could do it. They were talking about a schedule that kind of worked for us. And so um, the leadership of Cavium came up to Seattle to meet with Peter and myself. And we met at Paddy Coyne's now closed Irish pub in the South Lake Union area. We reached agreement and man, Cavium was wonderful to work with. Just a lot like AWS itself, very customer focused, absolutely not afraid of a challenge and able to move quickly. The original Nitro system delivered in 2013. So it really wasn't much time at all. And it was delivered in EC2, uh, C3, R3, and I2. So that got us going. And it's good to get going. We're happy with how it's going. It's lots going on. The next chapter happens at the Virginia Inn. We're still, still in 2012. Um, this, this is an historic um, venue in the Seattle area. 1903 is when it was built. I'm a big fan. I've stopped off here many, many times over the years. Four days a week, kind of a, a, a pattern for me, is at the end of the workday, I would drive home, and I would stop at the inn, and I'd meet with a customer, a, a startup, or a supplier. Invariably, these were interesting meetings. Sometimes I learned something, and just occasionally I'd come across a, a gem. And this is where I first met Nafa, the CTO of Annapurna, at one of these meetings. But before we get to that, let's set some context. This is, there's a couple things that are going on that are really important. And, and it really influences how, how we were looking at, at the semiconductor world and why we were interested in getting, in getting more deep in semiconductors. So the first one is a belief that volume drives everything. I've, and because I believe that volume drives everything, I, I believe that ARM and the ARM instruction set architecture is going to be a big part of server-side computing. I blogged this back in 2009, and it's not a complicated story. The volume that ARM's driving is so substantial, but in 2018, they, in aggregate, done 90 billion ARM processors sold to embedded devices. So what that tells me is that kind of volume, that kind of volume drives a lot of innovation. And I've been talking to ARM and talking to ARM and talking to ARM and encouraging them to invest in, in, in server-side computing because with those volumes, you could produce a very interesting server. And so, you know, this has been going on for years. It's something we firmly believe in. We, this industry is all about volume. Anytime you can do something at scale, it, it, it opens up more R&D investment. You can do more for customers. And really, the reason why I'm still at AWS 13 and whatever uh, years later is because every time we grow, it makes more things possible. We could never have done semiconductor work if our customers hadn't trust us at extreme scale to run their workloads. And because of that, we can invest more. And so really the same thing is going on at AWS that's going on at ARM. Great work brings lots of customers, allows more innovation, and more great work is what follows from it. So from my perspective, the, the conclusion is preordained. ARM's mobile and IoT volumes are going to feed the R&D investment necessary to produce great server processors. So that's the first one. The second context point, and it's different, is just an observation. And it doesn't sound scary, but, but, but for me it is. And that is this. Servers are big, complicated devices that, that fit on a board. They used to be big, complicated devices that are much larger than a refrigerator. They're, they're, they're getting smaller. And in fact, what's happening is the server on a board, more and more and more of a server is actually being sucked up onto, onto the package. Eventually, this will take time, but eventually, in my opinion, a server is going to be a system on a chip. It'll all come up off the board and land on a chip. 
Well, servers today are quite a long way from that. They are, they are. But what happens in mobile, I've observed over the years, what happens in mobile ends up happening in servers. It just takes five to 10 years. And so in mobile, this, this, this is going on in a huge way. I'm convinced, and in fact, many of us are convinced that it's definitely going on. And if you think about it, why is that important to us? Well, we've been doing custom servers for a long, long time. We deliver more value to customers because we're doing custom servers. If all of the innovation in the server is being pulled up on chip, and we don't build chips, we don't innovate. And so that's just not a great place to, to be. And it just, that's just not how we work. We just do not want to be there. So back in 2013, I wrote a doc called AWS Custom Hardware. It was reviewed with Andy Jassy and Jeff Bezos. And this twin thesis, thesis one I talked to you about, ARM volume will yield a great server processor. Thesis two, server innovation is going to all be on a chip. Conclusion, AWS needs to do a custom processor. So that's the background. So at that time, it was like a couple weeks later, I got a call from NAFA saying uh, he would love to get together and show, and show me what Annapurna Labs is doing. And I, that sounds, sounds pretty good, the timing's excellent. Um, I thought they might have that CPU that we needed, or at least the beginnings of it. I didn't know exactly what I was fishing for, but oh, I, I really enjoyed the discussion with NAFA. Super innovative, um, super deep thinker, and I was very excited about Annapurna as a company across the board and it looked like they had absolutely the perfect part for our Nitro V2. And so that was kind of the beginnings of, of us working together. Now what happened from there is we very quickly got to work on Nitro V2 and shipped it quickly because Annapurna moves, moves like AWS, they move quick, and it became a reality, and we started to drive quite substantial volume, mainly because AWS was growing quite quickly, and every server, every server, is going out with a, a Nitro system part. And so because of that, we're shipping just a, a large number of, of Annapurna parts. And so the work was successful, volumes are going up quickly, and it starts to look more and more and more like we got to get a closer relationship. It just seems like there's just so much going on that where we're going to be innovating at a faster pace, we're, we're scaling the volumes quite quickly. Really, so what happened is Dan Grossman, who leads AWS uh, corporate development, he got in detailed discussions with Annapurna about us working more closely together. And where that went is um, basic, those talks proceeded fairly well. And by August of 2014, most of the groundwork was in place. And so myself, Peter DeSantis at the time was a VP of, of EC2. Billy was the CEO of Annapurna Labs and NAFA was the CTO of Annapurna Labs, we all got together at the now defunct Blue Oyster Seafoods. And the discussion is gonna focus on, would it be possible for us to work together as a single team? We collectively decided it really was in the best interest of customers and of both companies. Dan Grossman and Billy still had many months of work on details on working out exactly how, um, the, how the, the relationship would be structured. And in January, 2015, the acquisition was announced. It's now been seven and a half years since Annapurna joined AWS. The pace of innovation is still increasing. I'm super impressed with what the team has done so far. And the plans looking forward are awe striking. I'm just super, 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 super excited about what's possible and what's coming. And Annapurna, you know, they have big plans, but they deliver like clockwork. The entire team is, is an execution machine. So when I talk about these future plans and, and, and say, wow, you're going to love them, I can say it with confidence because the team just keeps delivering. It's a real privilege to work with the entire team in Annapurna. Thanks for following along this history of the last decade going back to 2012. Engineers like me spend most of our time looking forward. And so I'll tell you, the next decade is going to be even better. I'm looking forward to telling you more about it. Thanks for being here.